our final session uh, this afternoon at the uh, CTAM Europe Symposium. Um, a panel will dive into the rapidly evolving world behind two four-letter abbreviations, AVOD um, and FAST, both of which were actually briefly touched upon in the fascinating conversation um, between Kate and Christina uh, earlier. The panel will be hosted by uh, Kozer Kanji. Uh, Kozer is Managing Director at VOD Professional. Um, so Kozer will introduce uh, the panelists over to you, Kozer. Thank you very much, um, uh, Lucas, and uh, hello to everyone, and welcome to this CTAM Europe webinar on, as Lucas said, a VOD and FAST. Uh, I'm Kozer Kanji, I run VOD Professional, we're a consultancy we've been working in OTT since 2005. Um, on the panel with me today are, and I'm actually, Lucas, if it's all right, going to ask them to introduce themselves, uh, are in the order that I can see you all. Miriam, if you can start us off, please. Hi, everybody. I'm Miriam Laux. I'm the VP International Platform for Roku. I started with the company last year and joined from uh, Prime Video, where I was nearly five years uh, in the Munich office as well as the London office. And uh, before that, it was a long track record in, uh, in broadcasting overall. Uh, and now I'm at Roku and responsible for Roku's platform, international platform business. Uh, that means for all markets outside of the US um, and also uh, means that I'm in charge of the monetization effort, which is basically the content side of the business. So making sure that all the beautiful apps are on the service. Uh, the advertising piece, as well as our own AVOD offering, which is called the Roku channel. Um, now, let me maybe just one second tell me tell you a little bit about what Roku is, because oftentimes I, I, I see a little bit of a misconception of what Roku is. Um, people always think it's a device or solely a hardware company. And that's exactly how it started in 2008 uh, with the first streaming player that our current CEO and founder invented. Uh, on behalf of Netflix at the time and uh, before 2008, um, all kind of VOD uh, content was only really co computer-based. You could, could be only consumed on a computer, but with that streaming play, you could also bring um, VOD on the, on the TVs. Um, we also, in the meantime, have developed an operating system and working with over 15 TV brands around the world, TCL, Hisense Sharp, where Roku is basically the operating system on those TVs. And when people buy one of those TVs, they sign up and they become a Roku active um, account. And um, then at the moment, fast forward, we are um, um, serving 56 million people around the world. And uh, the strategy is always we go into a country and we build up the, 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 the device uh, infrastructure and making sure that we have a device penetration and then uh, with, with great content lineup. So we scale there and then we make uh, the customers really engaging uh, with the platform and then we monetize through advertising and also through the content revenue. So that's a little bit in a nutshell what Roku does. Um, thank you very much, Miriam. And uh, I'm very glad you introduced yourself there yeah, because uh, <laughs> it's, yeah, uh, but uh, you've, uh, you've done it way better than, than I could. Um, Alan, can you tell us uh, who you are and what you do at TV Rev, please? Sure. I am Alan Walk. I am the co-founder and lead analyst at TV Rev. We are a consulting firm based in Los Angeles and New Jersey. We have a newsletter that goes out every Friday. We have a website um, and we do different research projects for clients. Um, we come out with special reports several times a year. Right now, we're on a series about the smart TV ecosystem and how that's emerging in the US and worldwide. Um, yeah. And I do a lot of, I'm on Cheddar TV a lot and as, their, as one of their analysts and I do a lot of writing and speaking. And I just wanna say that Miriam would not have to do any of that explanation in the United States where Roku is the dominant, sure. dominant device and operating system for streaming TV. Uh, indeed, um, uh, Alan, uh, I'm sure Miriam is very grateful for that too, yeah, um, uh, but, but um, Roku has so much brand recognition in the States. Um, Sarah uh, from Magnite, please. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Sarah. I'm Director for Business Development at Magnite, focusing on Connected TV. So Magnite is a leading independent supply side platform. Um, we offer various tech solutions to our partners, so predominantly media owners, 
um, in order for them to manage their advertising inventory better and monetize such um, respectively. So apart from the tech solutions that we apply, we also offer operational support in particular for companies that are quite new to the space and also um, have an internal demand facilitation team which is basically a team that looks after um, advertisers and agencies in order to um, monetize inventory for our partners. Me personally, I look after EMEA um, and I support businesses such as broadcasters, device manufacturers, fast services and telcos, basically find the right solutions that we offer and apply them and be successful in the CTV space. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah. And finally, um, David from Viacom CBS. Thank you for, uh, for the inviting me to the panel. So uh, I'm ITP for international streaming. So all that has to do with the uh, streaming services from Viacom CBS outside of the US. Uh, so the company, for those who don't doesn't know, we operate into the fast uh, world with our uh, service called Pluto, which I think is uh, pretty successful in modern markets and we're expanding uh, rapidly. Recently, we announced uh, a deal with NAND in the Nordics to, to become the, the uh, fast place to go in the Nordics instead of replacing Biofree. So, uh, but we also live in, in the UK, in, in Germany, Italy, France, uh, the whole Latin America, US, and we have many more plans to, to, uh, to expand beyond that. I mean, we partner with people like uh, companies like Roku and we, we partner with My Night, so we are pretty active in all this kind of, uh, all this kind of uh, segment. But we also operate on the on the export world with our service uh, Paramount Plus that we operate in multiple markets and also with like the recent kind of JV that we signed with uh, with Comcast that by the way it's been approved by the European Union and uh, so we can talk more about that. So Sky Showtime is going to be launching in twenty two in in twenty two markets in Europe. Yeah, twenty two in twenty two markets. I mean, I never thought about that. So we're going to be pretty busy next year with our, all our launches in. Uh, in uh, fast with Pluto, but also in as well with Paramount Plus and Sky Showtime. Um, thank you very much, um, David, as well. Um, I should say to the audience that um, uh, there is a QA and a uh, bit at the bottom of the Zoom interface. If you do have any questions, please do line them up, yeah, and we'll get them as soon as possible. This webinar will last about 45 minutes. Let's get cracking. Um, this panel, Alan, this uh, uh, topic is AVOD and FAST. Uh, you invented the term FAST, yeah, I believe. Yeah, so can you tell us first of all um, what FAST actually is and how it differentiates from, how it's different from AVOD? Sure, sure. Yes, we did invent the term, or I did invent the term FAST, um, be on my tombstone. Um, <laughs> it's, um, it's, it stands for Free Ad Supported Streaming TV Service. Um, mm -hmm. And the reason we came up with it was to differentiate it from the overall AVOD market, a lot of which are, are sort of this hybrid subscription model. So at the time in the US, the biggest ad supported app was Hulu, um, which was a subscription. You, know, you had two, two tiers. You had a, 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 an ad free tier and then an ad supported tier. And there was a lot of that. So there were a bunch of services, Pluto um, and Tubi and Zumo that were in the Roku channel that were starting up that were free. And at that point, they were mostly reruns, but they were aggregators. They had a lot, a lot of programming on them. And yeah. that, that has really taken off now all around the world, but especially in the US where you have the big three OEMs, Samsung, Vizio, and LG have all rolled out their own fast. So when you buy one of their TVs out of the box, you know, there's 150 of these channels a big innovation in fast techno has uh, you know has has been these sort of linear like channels where you can actually you know where most of the programming is still on that linear you know linear scale and mo most all of them also have a VOD so if you're watching a show and you're like hey I want to watch more of this you can go to the VOD and continue to binge it but they yeah. sort of recreated that linear experience which is key and they have in the US particularly a much lower ad load than you have on traditional cable linear TV so hold on. So is the is the main factor that differentiates Fast and AVOD the fact that it's still a kind of linear schedule? Is that the main thing, or is it no? The fact that it's free, right? Okay, it's completely free. There's no yes. uh, premium light tier like there is on Hulu or anything like that. Exactly. Exactly. 
Okay, so in the old days, we might have called that AVOD, but then Hulu has always been like that, right? So it's always yeah. had a sort of premium light. Right, um, and, and so, do, so do a bunch of the other stream, yeah. you know, SVOD services. So HBO has something like that. By, you know, Paramount Plus has something like that, Peacock. So there's a lot of that sort of hybrid tier, which is, which is also AVOD, but it's not free. Okay, cool. Now, to the rest of the panel, I mean, look, we've all been working in the industry a while, right? Uh, we all should know our, our VODs, yeah, but let's just let's just sort of do a sort of quick fire round, yeah, and name some of them. So we all know what SVODs are, right? It's Disney, uh, Apple TV Plus, yeah, I guess, yeah, uh, Netflix, Amazon Prime Video. Those are the sort of main ones, and now TV, yeah, uh, as well. What are some of the AVODs, Miriam, um, that are, diff- are not fast on perhaps the Roku hardware um, that you sell around the world? Yeah, we do define it a little bit, a little bit differently. Sorry, sorry, okay. Alan, for violating sorry. your <laughs> your patent on this. But um, so we basically just make the differentiation between paid and ad supported TV. So paid supported. Paid is basically SOD and TVOD, and ad supported includes an ABOD, so an on demand kind of use case, as well as a free live linear channels. I can't give you a, a, a full kind of sp- spread between um, yeah. you know, um, paid and ad supported TV on Roku, but what we definitely have seen over the last, especially since the pandemic started, that um, the ad supported category was very, very fast growing. We actually launched last uh, week um, uh, 23 new live TV channels on the Roku channel in Canada that brings us up to 100 channels in Canada. And uh, they include um, channels like uh, Baywatch, very important, you know, I'm German, so it has to be Baywatch, and then Reuters, uh, as well as Doctor Who 24. Um, Yeah, so it is a growing, definitely a growing category, and it combines both the on-demand component as well as the semi-linear component uh, that Fast provides. Um, the the um, Baywatch thing is David Hasselhoff is still big in Germany. Exactly. Uh, yeah, um, uh, even even twenty years later, um, Sarah, how what what is BVOD? Yeah, and is there a difference between fast AVOD and BVOD? I mean, um, you know, it's as we all know, the the landscape is extremely fragmented and lots of these service providers, you know, they are either offering completely free services, which would be the fast models. or they offer completely, you know, subscription-based services, the ad- SVODs, and then there's mixed models in place, which we would um, define as AVODs as well. So um, from, from my perspective or from, from our perspective, we tend to look at the individual companies in the space. So, you know, we look at the broadcasters, which have their BVOD offering. So an example could be Join, um, which is the OTT BVOD offering of Cosim Z1 in Germany. And that, for instance, has a free access model, but also a tiered access where you pay a subscription model, like a monthly fee in order to access some originals and some other high quality content. Then we look at the OEMs, the device manufacturers like Roku or Samsung or LG, mm. um, and the FAST and the AVOD platforms. And uh, you know, FAST could be the likes of Pluto and obviously then also the, the offering by Samsung. Um, some of the maybe local AVOD examples could be Vipu in Germany or Molotov TV in France. Yeah. Um, then we also look at distributors, um, which are the likes of Amagi, Well, or Funke in Germany, that are actually um, uh, helping media companies curate content and distribute that out to different platforms. And then lastly, we actually also look at telcos because yes. differently to the US, where telcos have you know long had a space in that advertising side of the business, in Europe, it's a very much emerging thing. And it's mm-hmm. uh, yeah, super interesting to watch. So it's, all, it's always been interesting the differences in strategy between, for example, the States and the UK and in Europe as well. So, I mean, in the, um, let's say, 2006 to 2008, maybe the first true OTT cycle, product development cycle, in the States, there was a lot of convergence. Everybody got together quickly and went for Hulu. In the UK, by comparison, BBC iPlayer launched as a standalone product, ITV Hub, ITV Play, it was called at the time, launched as a standalone product. 4OD from Channel 4 was the first terrestrial broadcaster in the world, I believe, that launched its own uh, on-demand service as well. Um, David, at Viacom CBS, you look after both paid and free 
uh, models, yeah, and services. Uh, and you've just launched, as you say, Sky Showtime is coming up next year as well, albeit that that's with the partner Comcast, yeah, and Sky. Do you guys have a kind of, you must have conversations internally about which strategy you're going to deploy for which product? Not only we have Fast or, uh, or SBOT, but also we cannot operate BBOT because we have Channel 5 in the UK with My5, but also we have Telefe in Argentina, which operates My, My Telefe, which is kind of a kind of BBOT. I think BBOT is more kind of for free to wear big stations that applies. But I mean, internally, we have this kind of clear differentiation in between kind of pure free products like Pluto and our paid services. And we think that both uh, can coexist. They have different business models. Uh, we are targeting different kind of uh, segments of people, although sometimes there is kind of a, a match in between kind of a, kind of subscribers to a paid service can watch as well at the same time uh, uh, for services. So we don't have any kind of, uh, I mean, we, we have a lot of conversations about sometimes kind of windowing or smart windowing. Yeah. In some cases, we we just recently launched, and I don't know how much to follow, but we launched a new season of uh, Star Trek Discovery in Pluto. Yeah. In the UK, Italy, Germany. So this I means sometimes, depending if we have Paramount Plus or not, we use Pluto, and this helps us to kind of gain subscribers and monetize better on the platform. So we have this discussion, but the company is fully on board into a dual strategy of uh, fast, with Pluto and Facebook with Paramount Plus and, and Sky Showtime. The strategy, by the way, whatever you are using seems to be working because from my sort of notes here, I've got the Pluto ended Q3 just now with uh, 54 million monthly active users. I mean, it's, it's really growing. I mean, as these services should be growing, there's growing really a lot. Yeah. Uh, because, I mean, well, the US is getting to a, I don't say, say it's like a plateau, but it's like, is getting to a point which is, is more difficult to grow, but international markets are, are there. And this is why we are like, we just closed this deal with NEN. In the Nordics, we hopefully we can announce more of this kind of deals in, in Europe and in other markets. So, and Pluto is, is well, back is recently announced. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, a plus billion business yes. like uh, three years ago. So, I mean, the, the segment I think is growing and it's showing the healthy, uh, healthy healthy momentum. So yes. uh, I think it's, it's probably, it's, it's kind of working and we can have this kind of dual strategy with a strong fast product and a strong s offering. Uh, and its acquisition cost was $340 million and it's yeah. now, as you say, over a billion dollars. The value. Yeah, it's, it's 340, I mean, it's a lot of money. I mean, yeah. <laughs> to me, yeah. I, mean, I think when we're talking about today's money, I mean, it doesn't seem to be that no, what, what's a million here or there, or even a 10 million here or there? Um, Sarah, the clients that you guys deal with at Magnite, and you were at SpotX before the, the acquisition as well, which was um, which was this year. Do you differentiate as well between fast and AVODs? Do those businesses come to you with different needs, or is it by and large? I mean, look, you're a server side platform, you, you're responsible for. for uh, delivering and monetizing adverts, yeah, are they all the same to you, or is there a differentiation? So, yeah, I, th I would say that fundamentally, when it when we talk about the advertising side of things, they are both trying to achieve the same outcome, really, in in the CTV space. They both yeah. want to maximize their advertising revenue using various demand sources, using the right technology and the right partners that help them on an operational point of uh, point of view. Um, and then also they want to optimize user experience across all devices and screens. So not just looking at the content that they actually provide to their users, but also very importantly, looking at the ad breaks, um, because obviously, um, you know, in the linear space, we're used to perfect ad insertion. You know, we're used to seeing an ad next to, the to another without buffering and also making sure that there's not the same ad next to one another. So this mm -hmm. is kind of the experience that we need to maintain in the CTV space. And this is basically what they uh, aim for as well. Um, I would say when it comes to the differences, it's more around um, the type of content that they offer. And, you know, we've spoken now about FAST and AVODs yeah. uh, before. FAST, it's, it's scheduled linear-like content. And on the AVOD side of things, it's usually on-demand content, which a user chooses, um, you know, proactively and watches whenever they want to watch it. 
Um, and then the other side, I would say, which slightly differentiates them is the distribution. Um, so we, we see lots of fast um, partners distribute across many platforms using often the likes of Amagi or Whirl or others in order to integrate their channels into the likes of Samsung or Pluto or others. Um, and then on the able side of things, um, we often look at it as a standalone owned and operated app. Um, they use often their own content or licensed content, and this is distributed firstly across different devices. So we're not mm. just speaking about connected TVs, we're also speaking about mobiles and uh, desktop um, environments, um, and they would be discoverable within the individual app stores or if you're someone like Netflix or someone else that is really big and, and uh, powerful, you, you can get pre-installed on, on CTVs yeah. depending on your business model. But this yeah. is basically how we look at it. It's from an advertising point of view, um, it's, you know, fairly, they're fairly similar in terms of what they're looking for. Um, Alan, I was, by the way, Sarah, I do want to ask you about the size of the market. Yeah. And we did, we did, I'm not, by the way, putting Sarah on the spot here. You know, we did talk <laughs> about, um, about this number before. Do you have a number? Um, so, you know, I was looking at this, right. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the ad supported side of the business is much easier to define because we just look at ad spend. When yeah. we look at SWOT, obviously we're very much reliant on individual players sharing, sharing their revenue figures, their subscription figures, which is not something that is often as easily uh, attainable. Yeah. Uh, so I was rather looking at it from this perspective. So SWOT, as we know, is still dominant in, in Europe. Um, I have found that 70% of Europeans are using SWOT services. And when it comes to time spent, this is almost double as, as or twice as high than um, time spent on AVOT devices. Right. But the AVOT sector is growing, uh, you know, massively. Um, when we look at ad spend in that area, looking at just programmatic video, which is uh, basically video placed across all environments, that is worth 5.2 billion in Europe. And then looking just at CTV ad spend in 2020, ad spend grew by 20 to 22% to yeah. almost 20 million US dollars in the UK. And that is, that's a, that is a massive figure. And yeah. looking at the UK or looking at Europe, um, we know that you, the UK accounts for about 70% of the CTV spend. Okay. Um, yeah, so okay. it's a pretty big market. and. Con, you know, constantly growing. We also know that looking at the ad spend, um, this figure is not on par just yet with the actual scale yeah. of the CTV market. So there's a lot more to 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 gain. Yeah, um, Alan, it's always been fascinating to me about how. So, for example, earlier this year, I was working with a major European broadcaster who is now going to go D to C. They're going to launch their own standalone apps, but they were already on Miriam, they were already on Roku. Yeah, uh, they were available on other platforms, uh, exactly as Sarah said as well, which is that um, you, you want to be where the audience is, right, Alan? Yes. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and d does launching your own DTC help with that? Or might you as well just stay with the platforms where the audiences are? Well, one of the one of the advantages to launching your own DTC, which is also sort of the advantage between you know what we see as AVOD and FAST, is data, right? If I have to sign up for the D2C app, then you have my name and my email address. If you're charging me money for it, you also have my credit card. Um, we don't have GDPR in the US, so um, there's a lot more that they can do in terms of targeting people and attribution and whatnot once yes. you have that data. So, you know, if you can go from something like, yeah, the fast that are on a small, you know, somebody's watching on so an Amazon device and you have no idea who's actually watching it um, beyond maybe the IP address to something where you have all sorts of data about the person, including how often they watch the app and when and, you know, and what shows they watch. So from an advertising point of view, it is a benefit to have both, to have your own yeah. app because those are also going to be your most frequent users are people you can sort of, you know, aim things at and also for targeting purposes. Uh, Miriam, have you noticed that as well? That um, there's a kind of, um, let's say, you know, you can be on as, you can be promiscuous, yeah, for want of a better word. You can be on as many platforms as, you, as you'd like to be rather than just putting all your eggs in one basket. 
No, I agree. I think, you know, every broadcaster or every content offer has to follow the eyeballs. And when the eyeballs are going into various platforms and definitely into streaming, as we see now, you know, all the content offers have to kind of follow or ideally lead the way. Um, so um, we definitely see that uh, there is a... Um, Oh, we might have lost Miriam. No. Oh, you are. You're back. Okay. Can you just repeat the question one more time? Yeah, I was just saying that, you know, it's not an either or situation, is it? Yeah. Ah, sorry. Yes. Now I got it back. Sorry, I just lost my chain. <laughs> so definitely we have to go um, through the, um, uh, you have to go, you have to follow where the eyeballs are. There are like two different ways how you can do it. Either you can obviously go for your own service, you know, your own D2C or a service either than on the neighbor side or as an escort side that has yeah. lots of advantages. Some of them, Ali mentioned, the first party data is obviously super interesting. Also, you have more creative freedom. You can go out and do your user experience exactly how you do it. You can yeah. also do that across various markets. So you only have to build one app and then go on the, all the global platforms and basically launch it. For example, like Brick, Brickbox, you know, started you know, they have it, you know, now in different, in, in various countries. Um, but then there is also the advantage of the B2B2C model, which is something yes. like Prime Video Channels uh, offers, or also uh, from Roku, we have that in the US, we, which we call a service, which we call premium subscription. That is interesting for, t for like the large players to offer an additional access point. So they have sometimes their own uh, on Roku as well, sometimes their own um, app, as well as, they get aggregated into the premium subscription into the b2b2c model so they have an additional access point and it makes you know the exposure to the clients to the customers the end customers more and for the smaller guys you know they don't necessarily have the budget to you know fund an app development and also not just the app development but you have to maintain it all the time as well yeah. you have to kind of you know do updates left and right and refreshes and all that so that's pretty costly. So for smaller guys, having an aggregated B2B2C model is also beneficial. So we can we can see definitely both in these cases. Um, the David, it's been fascinating to me. For years, we've been moving slowly to a subscription world. Yeah, so not just S board, but an S everything. Yeah. So um, software in the old days, you used to be able to buy Microsoft Outlook. Yeah, and that's it. You would have that copy for well, as part of Microsoft Office for years. Now it's a subscription model with Adobe products is the same. Uh, with having my vegetables delivered, yeah, that is now a, a subscription too. What's fascinating to me is how much elasticity is there in consumer budgets for entertainment? Yeah, um, do budgets increase? Yeah, because there are more entertainment options available now than before? Or do consumers say, actually, I'm going to drop this subscription to take out that subscription? And is that where Avod and Fast really, you know, comes to the fore, because you don't have to pay for it? I mean, this is the kind of really on a follow-up question about how many subscriptions people will take. Yeah. You probably will see next year. I mean, it's, it's all about this kind of streaming words and how many subscriptions people will, will retain and you see more about kind of Facebook services uh, launching those kind of new shows on a weekly basis to retain subscribers for a long period. So I think we will see more of this kind of uh, fights for uh, for uh, for retaining subscribers uh, and the churn and the output. All of these things are going to be like uh, 20 is going to be pretty intense. But yeah. I mean, I was, I was looking at a question from Lucas and this goes together with your question about, I mean, I think it's good to have like a fast service and export service in the same company. And some in, in our case as well, we have these massive free to work stations in the UK, in Argentina, in, in Australia. Because at the end of the day, you create an ecosystem and you want to have your, I mean, you want to have the the viewers, the fans, the customers consuming on your on your services. And it doesn't matter if it's sometimes it's like with with my five or they switch to Pluto or they go to Paramount Plus. At the end of the day, I mean, you want them to be in your ecosystem. I mean, it's not about cannibalization, how many people will go from one service to another service. It's, I mean, cannibalization is better that you do it yourself than if that is done by like a third party. So I think we we, we feel good about this kind of, uh, you know, having our own freeware stations, our pay TVs, our fast services and our export services. You know, we can cross promote many of them using our kind of big, uh, big reach. And we are happy that people switches from one to another. At least they are attached to our kind of uh, content and they are happy 
to watch it in Pluto or in Paramount Plus. I don't know if I, if I answer to your million dollar question, but I would decide it's a difficult one to answer to you. It, it is a difficult one to answer, but I think your answer makes sense, which is that you can let viewers decide where they want to watch that content and give them the different model options, the different pay model options. And I think this also goes very linked with, uh, with uh, what Miriam was mentioning. Everything is about reach, and there are many ways that you can reach these people. You can have it, I mean, you have your own D2C service, uh, but then you have to have to make your kind of uh, apps available in as many devices, and this will be kind of connected to this, the yeah. task force, because I mean, this is a growing kind of uh, segment, uh, and you have to partner with the Samsungs, with the PLCs, with the LGs, with the Rokus, uh, with the Fire TVs, I mean, you name it. I mean, so it's, I think yeah. it's more about like a partnership world that we're moving, that it was super clear some years ago, but now it's becoming like, you know, you need to partner with as many platforms as possible and to make, it's not about just distribution, it's about how you market the content, how you market your proposition, how you kind of price it your proposition. So it's it's a whole ecosystem that we need to take care of. And then we've got the really big disruptor coming over the next few years, which is Metaverse, yeah, uh, if, uh, uh, if, we, if we actually get there. On that score, panelists, all four of you actually, but let's start with Alan and then go to Sarah on this. Is this the golden age of SVOD? Yeah, is is SVOD going to decline in favour of, of AVOD and FAST, or is this really just a sort of cycle, a cyclical thing that we're going through right now, and the subscriptions might make a, uh, a huge return at some point in the future? Alan, what's your what's your feeling from, from a consultancy perspective from yeah, looking sure. at the market? Sure. I mean, I think what we're going to see some contraction in the SVOD space, not in the number of people who use it, who watch it, but the number of services. I think, you know, yeah. you're already starting to see some mergers going on. You have, you know, Disney, you have, um, you know, Discovery and Warner, and they also own CNN, which is, you know, the big news service. Are they going to launch a single app? Disney has sort of a bundle with Disney in, in the U.S., with Disney and Hulu and ESPN, you know, and in Europe, as I think as David was mentioning, that you know you have a deal between basically CBS and NBC in the U.S. So it's Comcast and you know and Viacom to put out Peacock and Paramount Plus together or, or Showtime as well. So I think we're going to start seeing a lot more of that, a lot more bundling of the streaming services. Right? We've been calling it not not just TV Rev, but in the U.S. is being called the Great Rebundling, where we're going to start seeing people offering broadband plus a bunch of streaming services for X number of dollars. And that's going to sort of become a big thing. I think people watch the streaming services and the, you know, the ad supporters for different reasons. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, there's clearly some overlap, but by and large, a lot of the fast viewing is sort of, you know, I just want something, I want something comforting. I want, we call it, you know, comfort food TV. I want something that I can, don't have to sort of pay rapt attention to versus yeah. something like succession where I don't want anybody to talk to me. And that's what I'm doing. It's sort of tunnel vision at the moment. And both are equally valid ways to watch TV. And I don't think that behavior is changing. Now, for me, I've got to say the linear TV is kind of comforting. Yeah. And as yeah. much as I don't, I don't really have to pay attention to it. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not actively watching linear TV all the time. Whereas on demand OTT, I've actually gone through an active process to be able to get that show playing on that screen. Yeah, I've had to find it's, it or- this is, the, this is one of the fruits of claim. I mean, it's like a lean back and just enjoy it. You don't have to make choices. And, yeah. yeah. Somebody is, is, is curating this content in kind of several channels for you. So it's more like a lean back experience and you know, you're sick of making choices and selecting content or scrolling through content that you don't know, you know if you're gonna like it or not. So this is, this is kind of one of the claims of, of Pluto. Yeah. I mean, it is, it is a, a, the comfort food, right? So it's very similar. Somehow the history always repeats itself. You have, you know, the cable TV, especially in the US where there's a lot of, you know, you know, more highbrow, more, you know, fictional, difficult things. And then there is the comfort food of broadcast TV, very similar. So it's much more mainstream, much broader, you know, maybe e more easier access and definitely more lean back. We, we see that this is why I also think that SWOT and ABOT will be complementing themselves for a long time to come to come. I don't think there is anybody, maybe in the number of uh, of players, uh, as Alan mentioned, but not in the consumption overall that will not reduce. We believe that all TV will be streaming at some point and all advertising will be yeah. streaming at some point. Yeah. Uh, yes. 
and SVOD will continue to grow, David, especially if windows are being chopped in half, like uh, putting all the movies on, on Paramount Plus as well. Um, there are questions coming in from the audience, so I, I ought to get to those because particularly as, as we only have about, about 10 minutes left in this session, but let's have a look at some of the questions. Uh, right, so, um, does Pluto take share of time spent away from traditional broadcast or SVOD? This is from an anonymous, very strategically anonymous yeah, uh, person. Um, David, any thoughts on that? Does Pluto yes. take share away from traditional broadcast or SVOD? I mean, it's difficult to kind of answer that because, I mean, we don't know how, you know, the consumption of all these kind of individuals. I think that the sum of the two, kind of the, 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 what people spend in Pluto on, sorry, in Pluto, in fast services or in SBOT, the combination of both is more than it used to be before. So this is why we're happy with our strategy of having like multiple touch points. So I don't know if the is taken away from free or from SBOT, mm -hmm. but what we know is that having like a, you know, this kind of dual strategy of having fast and SBOT is good for us because we can tap into different kind of consumption habits. Yeah. And probably the kind of overall consumption is growing because people have more choices. Yeah. But I mean, we have to be honest to ourselves. I mean, people have other choices, not just as what on fast. They have TikTok. I mean, especially when we talk about joining generations, they have Instagram. So there are many choices that are taken from kind of people's life. Uh, but I think that, you know, having more options probably increases the, the average consumption. Yeah. Uh, and that leads, Sarah, to a sort of tangential question, which is that there is certain content that is better on AWOD, right, than SWOT, like current affairs, sport. So, um, I mean, I'm speaking again from an advertising perspective, and yeah. I personally believe that there is not necessarily certain content that works better on AWOD models than SWOT when it comes to advertising. Because generally, um, you know, there, there is a clear value exchange on the big screen. We are watching high quality content if it is linear TV or streaming, and we're accepting that there will be advertising placed. And that sort of transcends genres, I would say. We're also seeing, um, you know, live sports, for instance. We're seeing players like The Zone, which have previously focused on subscription models, now right. introduce ads to sort of test the waters here. Um, mm -hmm. And from an advertiser perspective, actually, they tend to be interested in most genres, obviously, based on their business model and what, what, what products they're actually promoting. But um, the contextual relevancy is here. Um, plus, CTV audiences are really key consumer groups. We've seen in studies that we've, um, we've run and other studies from, from partners that um, audiences are shifting away from linear into streaming, which means that fundamentally linear audiences, which are still key audiences, of course, are becoming older, whereas CTV yeah. audiences are more and more reflecting the national uh, population when it comes to demographics and other factors. So it's key audiences that can be reached not on SVOD, but, but on AVOD services. Um, and on top of things, of course, you have the targeting capabilities. So I think yeah. in the end, you know, it's up to the media owner to decide what works best for their business model. But I also believe that these hybrid models between tiered, you know, SVOD subscriptions and ad supported models are increasingly becoming the norm, also mm -hmm. seeing the increase in ad spend in the in the AWOT space. Um, the reason, by the way, Sarah, thank you for the answer there. The reason I asked about sports is because sports kind of loses its currency almost immediately. Yeah, um, as soon as, if you're watching a, ma a football match at the World Cup, let's say, um, it only maybe has two or three hours after it's been aired, yeah, while it's still current, because you can hardly not see the score, yeah, by the time you're reading the newspapers in the evening, yeah, so that's what I mean about, about sports. Um, let's get to the second, or the other question that we've got here, actually, we've got a bunch of questions in the other screen as well, so uh, another anonymous attendee, I love you guys, yeah, um, uh, this is one for uh, Miriam, have you looked at this, Miriam, so how do channels get launched on fast platforms like Pluto and Roku, what percentage of pitches are successful, and what factors get your attention to be successful in getting selected? So actually, this is a really good point. Yeah, it's it's not like everybody, Miriam, who comes to Roku and says, "Hey, I'd like to put a channel on Roku." You guys just say, "Yes, sure, come on in." Yeah, you are more discerning, if that's the right word. You certainly have some qualifications that you need. Yeah, there is qualifications, but there is also a self-serve uh, program that uh, that Roku offers. So if you are 
complying with, you know, and it's very kind of uh, self-serve mode. Uh, you basically upload and you do all of the things yourself. Um, that if, and if you comply with all the regulations there, you know, in terms of what content should be in there and whatnot, then, then you can also, um, you, you can just uh, have, have the local channel. I mean, we have in Canada, you know, it was 16,000 channels there. So there's definitely a lot of uh, smaller channels, um, but yeah, in a self-serve mode. 16,000, did you say? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, one day we're going to get those numbers from you. Yeah, about uh, who's watching, uh, who's watching what there. Um, David, what about from, from the Pluto? So, uh, yeah, I think, I mean, Pluto allows us to, 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 to make more experiments. Yeah. With your whole, in, pay TV. in the US, Pluto had around 250 channels, UK 150, Spain, we recently arrived to 100. So we have all these kind of thematics and, and genders. And, and, and so we, we, but what Pluto allows is to, to be more experimental. I mean, it takes around like four to six weeks to set up a channel and, and launch it. Uh, we have thematic channels, we have like a seasonal channels. So I think it's a good platform to test and see if something works. We keep yes. it to extend it. It doesn't work. It's not the end of the world. You substitute for another channel. Uh, but you know, we have all this kind of segmentation of you know classic movies or I mean, it's it's I think it's it's a good platform to experiment, and we we happy to onboard uh, content that it's 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 interested for people. I mean, and also we need to we need to be aware that there is a lot of content out there that has a difficult window to be seen because it's all content. Uh, there is, I mean, it's not suitable for s -bot. So I think platforms like Pluto, and, and by this is not that it's like not good content, but sometimes it's, it's difficult to find some old movies or some old series that people was attached. So I think platforms like Pluto or our competitors is a good place for, for, for having this, this content place. And, and actually it leads, I mean, I mentioned Metaverse kind of facetiously you know, over there, but what is coming undoubtedly is Web 3.0 and the idea that if you are a content producer, um, you're going to be able to, because of blockchain, for example, you're going to be able to put that content on various different platforms and get paid you know, uh, for it. In other words, it will allow for micro licensing. So instead of having to buy a title for say two years or five years or or even six months you might be able to buy a title for a week yeah and put it on the platforms um of your choice to to be watched and no, no, no. this is well. many kind of content owners yeah find difficult to monetize they cannot be a library to monetize it in a very nice way I mean, and they, they when they get the check as a whole i mean because yeah. I mean, some of this content was on the shelves uh and now it, it's with the problems like pluto I think yeah. we're starting to realize what the value of the long tail content, I would say. Yes. Yeah. Miriam, any final thoughts on, on that? I think what makes that interesting, I mean, yes, I believe that, that every platform needs long tail. Obviously, we see that the engagement is with the larger channels. I think that's uh, the, the, the long tail is serves a purpose as it you know really offers something for a, and for the, that niche specifically so it's highly relevant for that niche but the overall mass market kind of consumption comes obviously from the from the larger services the interesting mm -hmm. piece is for a platform from a platform point of view how do you manage that number of channels and make still everything discoverable for every customer so that it's like highly personalized and highly relevant to that that's the big challenge for every, that every every uh, platform is is trying to solve yeah. with different features, different user journeys, post personalization, profiles and all that. But that's that's the big challenge. Um, we've got one minute left. I'm going to ask you a question uh, each, which is slightly provocative yeah, and probably demands a larger answer. But if we could do a yes, no. Alan, will Netflix go, will Netflix introduce an advertising model? Not under the current management. Fine. Okay. Uh, Sarah? No, I don't think so. I think their focus is more on gaming on on content on uh, user retention algorithms to improve recommendations but yeah not a bot for now not, not a bot right uh david don't think so. i mean i agree with the other kind of uh, members of the panel and i think the focus is kind of global services and probably potentially in southeast asia with a big market still to explode in different yes. kind of price points but not for a time and Miriam? agreed with everybody not at this point 
No, I should have asked who will buy Netflix. Yeah, but that, <laughs> that is the subject of a different panel, I suspect. Um, I would like to thank uh, our panelists, to, uh, to Miriam Lowe from Roku, to Alan Roke from TV Red, uh, to Sarah Galson from um, uh, Magnite, formerly Spot X, yeah, and to David uh, uh, Gell from uh, Viacom CBS. Uh, Lucas, uh, I think I'm handing back to you now. Thank you very much. And uh, Louise as well. Thank you very much. Um, that was an interesting afternoon, um, wrapping up with a session about uh, a very fragmented uh, but rapidly evolving uh, space uh, in the Avold and the Vasts, uh, preceded by HBO Max and their very impressive uh, ambition levels, um, which I'm sure looking at uh, Kamikaze, what a reel that was. With content like Kamikaze, they will uh, they will be able to fulfill those ambitions. And starting off with the with the fact that seventy percent of us, seventy four percent of us, identify as gamers, um, which is uh, which is massive. So that was a great a great afternoon. Uh, thank you all, Louise. Yes, thank you very much. Really fantastic, really interesting sessions this afternoon. Thoroughly enjoyable. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining. Huge thank you to today's moderators panelists, guest speakers, really interesting afternoon. Thank you, of course, as always, for all the support from our strategic partners and associate members. Really, thank you very much all. Thank you, Ron. And thank you, uh, Peter and uh, Karen, uh, for making it work uh, this time around. I do hope more of you will be able to join, um, to join me in France uh, in uh, March at the CTAM Europe INSEAD Executive Training Programme, which is as you can see here on the 20 to the 25th of March. So with that, um, thank you all for attending and I hope to see you all soon. Goodbye. Bye-bye.